afternoon. My name is Heather Stuyvesant. Welcome to my art exhibit. Um, and I thank you for being here today. I know that you're going to really enjoy what Tyler has to say. You're going to learn quite a bit. I learned a ton reading this book. And it was actually the background, his book and one other book, the background for the art that's on the walls. It's the reason I did this artwork. And so it's important to, to share that. So you'll learn what Tyler has to say, but also you may, it may help you connect to the work that's here. Um, I, I wrote down something that mm -hmm. I want to share. Um, I read Tyler's book, City of Dreams, as backward, background for these artworks. And it wasn't long before these many waves of immigrants that he talked about became real to me. And it was because he has a very deft way of using personal stories and specific individuals. And what I wrote down was that the Boston Globe said the stories in his book were told brilliantly, even unforgettably, and it's an American story and one that belongs to all of us. And I really think it does belong to all of us because I don't think there's anybody in this room who is not either an immigrant or a child or a grandchild of an immigrant. That's, that's what America is. My, um, my father's family came here in 1900 from a little shtetl that I was told was Austria, but I have since seen it was in Ukraine, which is some of the Ukraine pictures. And my mom was a war bride, and so she was married and had a child before she came to America from Scotland. So even, you know, my background. And you talk about your immigrant background, and it, one of the nice things about that is that it threads through the story and it makes it very approachable and very real as, you, as I hear about your family. So, how does it <laughs> A former history professor from George Washington University, Tyler Handbinder, is a historian specializing in American immigration, New York City, and the era of the Civil War. He's the author of three award-winning books, in March, he published his latest volume, Plentiful Country, The Great Potato Famine, and The Making of Irish New York. Tyler's publications have been honored with the Avery Craven Prize for the Organization of American Historians, the Mark Linton History Prize of the Columbia School of Journalism, the Hubble Prize of the Society of the Civil War of Engineers. He has also held the Fulbright Commission's Thomas Jefferson Distinguished Chair in American History at the University of Utrecht in the Netherlands, and has won three prestigious research grants from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Please join me in welcoming Tyler and Biden. So I thought we would just do a, some question and answer. So if it's okay with you, I'd like to start with my first question. Because I began creating this artwork um, based on current immigration issues. And when I read Tyler's book, I couldn't help noticing that although the countries of origins have changed, the stories seem to be the same. The overall immigrant experience seemed the same over 400 years. So I wanted to know your thoughts about that. Do you find it is the same? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that was the reason I wrote City of Dreams, is because in teaching, American immigration history, which I did first at the University of Wyoming and then at George Washington University for 26 years. Um, the thing that strikes you when you teach the history of American immigration from the beginning to the end is how the, how the themes repeat themselves over and over. And that really there's nothing that there's nothing in the immigrant experience of today that wasn't experienced 100 years ago, 200 years ago, 400 years ago. And, but people don't know that. Every, you know, most Americans think today's immigrants are different than immigrants from the past. But what you see when you, when you look at American immigration history is every generation of Americans thought that their day's immigrants were different than the past and were uniquely unqualified to become quote unquote true Americans. So every generation, you know, the only group about which that wasn't said was English immigrants. Every other group has been scorned and ridiculed and discriminated against and called, and there have been calls to ban them, um, calls to not let them become citizens. Um, so 
So, right, that's, that's the theme you see. And I felt like people didn't realize that. And my hope was that by writing City of Dreams, they would see that, that you know, because people say about today's immigrants what other Americans said about their own immigrant ancestors, that they ought to have a more open mind about immigrants in general. Yeah. So for the immigrants themselves, do you think that their experience is radically different from the past? I mean, I know little differences like with the internet, they can keep in touch with their families and so forth, but overall their own experience is very similar as well, this the homesickness and, mm -hmm. and the difficulty adjusting. Yeah, I, I think that the that the life of an immigrant in New York today is really not that much different than the life of an immigrant from the past. Um, there's the homesickness, there is you know, starting at the bottom of the American socioeconomic ladder, getting the jobs that you know nobody else wants. Um, there's extremely hard work, um, working multiple jobs often, living in very crowded conditions so that you can save as much money as possible either to bring more family members over or to pay your debt that you incurred from immigrating or to start a business or to put your, you know, to give your kids a better life. Um, the, uh, another thing that's very common throughout New York City immigration history is um, that the assimilation experience is very similar in that people who immigrate to America as adults don't tend to assimilate very much compared to what native-born Americans expect them to do, right? And native-born Americans tend to think that if an immigrant is assimilating the way they're supposed to, then they will no longer have an accent, they will eat American foods, they'll read you know, books that native-born Americans are reading, they'll play the same games, they'll sing the same songs, and immigrants have never done that. You know, today's immigrants don't do that, you know, our Eastern European Jewish uh, ancestors didn't do that. Karen's Irish ancestors didn't do that. Uh, immigrants, immigrants who come as adults tend to, for the rest of their lives, think of the place they were born as home when they use that word. And they pine for it for one, in one way or another. Some groups less than others. Like, you know, the Irish would feel like that they had been kind of forced out through British the, the British occupation and the economic conditions that pose, you know, Eastern European Jews might feel feel kind of forced out of Europe by pogroms and, and uh, that kind of thing. Um, but no matter what group you were, um, there was pretty much the same reaction. Just virtually no difference. So I saw that with my own mother. She called Scotland home for her entire life, even though she lived here from 1947 until she died in 2010. So, but Scott was home. So, you talked about these, these different waves of immigrants, and I noticed your book was structured around the waves of immigrants. Was that just to organize the book, or, because it was very effective, or um, could you talk about your reasons for organizing it that way? And, Sure. Well, so the problem with writing a book about immigrant New York is there are so many immigrants and so many different immigrant groups that you can't possibly write about all the, you know, 200 or so immigrant groups that have ever come to New York. It's just impossible. So I had to come up with an organizing principle that would explain why certain groups were focused on and other groups got little bits of attention, but not as much. And so what I decided to do was kind of in every era of New York City's history, focus on the two biggest immigrant groups. Um, that didn't mean I wouldn't mention the others, but I would focus on those main groups. Um, and tell stories about them that kind of stood in for all the immigrants in that period, to the extent that one can do that. And then with waves, so that's the term that tends to be used to talk about immigrants, for better and worse. And in some ways, it's 
apt because immigration does ebb and flow. See, there's again a water, water terms. Um, but it does go up and go down and up and down um, fairly regularly. Mostly in response to the American economy. When the economy is doing well and there are lots of jobs, then immigrants want to come to America and get those jobs. And when the economy is not doing well and jobs are scarce, immigrants don't want a chance coming to, to America and being unemployed. Because immigrants throughout America, throughout the history of New York City have all agreed it's better to be unemployed some other country than in America. Since America is so expensive compared to where they're from, they don't want to be unemployed. In fact, a lot of immigrants would get here and then if there was a depression, they would go back to their homelands. Um, sometimes for better, sometimes for worse. Didn't you say the, the Italians often plan to do that? Or many Italians do? Right. So the Italian immigrants are one of the groups that um, plan, and not just to go back when the times were bad, but not to stay in the United States permanently at all. They didn't think of themselves as immigrants. They thought of themselves as migrants who are coming to the United States to earn money for a few years to pay off family debts, to buy a farm, things like that, um, to, to build a dowry for their daughters. Um, but then a lot of them got to the United States and for one reason or another decided not to leave either. It was harder to save up money than they thought and they felt they would be a disgrace to go back to uh, Italy without having saved the money they boasted that they would. Um, or they liked America better, or sometimes they just, uh, some World War I got in the way. So once World War I started, a lot of their Italians didn't want to go back because you might, your ship might get uh, torpedoed by a U-boat. So for all those reasons, there was a lot of people, people didn't end up always doing what they had planned to do. Right. I can see that. So we talked about the way immigrants were received by people who were already established in this country or felt they were true Americans. But it, uh, some of the interesting things that you spoke about was the way a particular wave of immigrants was received by the wave that came right before them. Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. I and mean, one of the, you know, when, when I talk in the book about how native born Americans tend not to perceive that today's immigrants aren't that different than their own immigrant ancestors. That can even be the case I found when it was your parents who were the immigrants and you remember them, you know, talking about some other place as home and eating different foods and, and so forth. And so even, even people who haven't been here very long, uh, the children of immigrants, often didn't have sympathy for immigrants in general, only for their group. There's you know, a lot of ethnocentrism in people that seems to be deeply ingrained. So they, didn't, they, they saw themselves as different than these other groups. And that's, that's been very common throughout, throughout American history and throughout New York history. And then you even get cases, the most extreme example would be something like with the Irish, where you'd have one group of Irish immigrants who discriminate against other Irish immigrants. So Protestant Irish would hate the Catholic Irish, um, or the Catholics from the South would, North would hate the Catholics. Catholics, even if they were Catholic from the North, would disdain the Catholics from the South and see them as different. So, um, and then you find that with Jews also in New York's history. The, um, you know, the Jews from Germany look down on the Jews from Eastern Europe. And, also, why it wouldn't be so um, uncommon for you, you know, for your ancestors to say they were from Austria when in fact they were from Ukraine because you thought you would be more respected in New York if you said you were from Central Europe rather than Eastern Europe. Yeah. That's really true. I, I saw something in my husband's family with, with Catholic things that I didn't know until I read a section of your book aloud about the Irish Catholic. Protestant. His family was Italian Catholic. And he said, oh, no, 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 we would never go to the same church as an Irish Catholic. It was a completely different thing. And then you covered that later in your book. So even the religion didn't bind them together. Right, right. Um, it's not clear whether it's 
the religion that they found too different or the ethnic groups, but, but right, so that's one example that I talk about in City of Dreams in detail and also in the Five Points book where um, Irish Catholics did not like when Italian Catholics started coming to their churches and would typically banish the Italian Catholics to the basements and the Italian Catholics were very unhappy with that and actually wrote letters to the Pope and said, this is not fair. And you wouldn't think that, that a typical you know, impoverished immigrant would have the gumption to write the Pope, but these letters still exist. And you can see them in the Vatican archives, um, saying this is not fair, or this is degrading, how can you let them treat us like this? And so Italian immigrants especially felt like they could write to the Pope because the Popes were Italian then. And the Italian immigrants thought that the Pope would have solidarity with them against the, the uh, with, against the Irish, who seem so different. So, um, so yes, yeah, so that, that was a big thing. The, and again, you find the same thing with Jews, with, with uh, German Jews not wanting Eastern European Jews to join their synagogues and, and so forth. It was a little easier for the Jews because there was a tradition that every group would start their own congregation, whereas the Catholic Church was supposed to be Catholic with a small c, and everybody was supposed to be together, but, um, and eventually, by the time you get to the early 20th century, the New York Catholic Church, which is still run by Irish New Yorkers, um, decides just to create separate congregations for these ethnic groups so that there isn't this ethnic conflict within the New York Church. Yeah. That, that was the thing that my husband spoke about. You mentioned the letters to the Pope, and I just want to say that was the thing I like almost most of all about this book, that the stories were taken from individual letters that you uncovered, somebody's diary. They were so personal and so specific. I really appreciated that. Thanks. And the, um, the previous generations of immigrants, I find that most Americans now think of Ellis Island instantly when you say, you know, an immigrant. And they, they kind of admire the, those who came at that time, but not, not today. What your descriptions about Ellis Island, how it came to be, and what the experience was like for those immigrants really stuck with me. It actually caused me to create one of the works that's here, the one with the, the bark of wire. Could you talk a little bit about that? About Ellis, Ellis Island? Island? Yeah. Sure, well, Ellis Island was created in the 1890s when the United States decided to impose strict, more restrictions on immigrants than they had in the past. So up until 1892, pretty much anybody could come to America without a passport, without any documentation at all, it didn't matter how much money you had, you just had to get on the boat, come to America. It would be a very cursory um, medical inspection on the ship just before the dock, but otherwise, Pretty much anybody could come before 1892. The exception was starting in the 1880s that uh, Chinese immigrants, and Chinese immigrants are uh, bad, well, um, basically Chinese laborers. If you were a Chinese minister, a Chinese business owner, you could immigrate to America. But uh, other than that, uh, the Chinese were banned starting in the 1880s. And then in the 1890s, Congress decides that all immigration should be restricted to some extent. Although, at that point, the restrictions are fairly minimal. Um, there was a more rigorous medical test. But even if you failed the medical test, you, could, you would be brought to the, Ellis, to the Ellis Island Hospital and cared for at the government's expense. And then when you were better, you were allowed into the country. Um, and then there were other things that, that they would that are banned by this point. You uh, couldn't, you weren't, weren't admissible if you were a socialist or a communist or an anarchist. And those are the kinds of questions you got asked. And so Ellis Island is created to create an inspection system to ask all those questions to do the more rigorous medical tests. Um, and, and that starts in 1892 and that goes on up through really the 1920s when really uh, 
draconian immigration restrictions are put in place that, that bans people from almost all parts of the world except northern and eastern Europe. At that time, were the women still separated? Women who arrived not accompanied by men were separated from men, uh, both on the ships that came to America. Oh, come sit down. It's okay. Correct. So both on the ships that brought them to America and at Ellis Island, they would be separated. Uh, women traveling without male relatives. And then, unlike men, when men passed through the Ellis Island inspection and were approved, they just entered the country. But if you were a woman, unaccompanied by a man, they wouldn't let you off, off of Ellis Island until a male relative came to fetch you. Uh, because the fear was that a woman going out into the country would be, you know, become uh, forced into prostitution without a man to protect her. But they had um, other ways of protecting, protecting in quotes, uh, people who arrived that you described a little bit in the book. Um, because, I'm trying to remember the, the term, there were people who came that tried to get them to- Oh, the immigrant runners. Runners, right. thank you. <laughs> right, so one of the reasons that up until the 1850s, there was no immigration reception at all. Just your ship docked at any pier along the Hudson, along the East River, you just got off the boat. And those at, on, at the uh, dock side, you would be met by these people known as immigrant runners, who were um, people who were trying to basically fleece you out of your money by uh, offering to carry your bags, but then they'd run away with them and then hold them for ransom. People who would say um, they had a place for you to stay, but then charge an exorbitant amount, or just rob you. Um, <laughs> so, the first immigrant, immigrant reception station, which was at the very bottom of Manhattan Island, um, at a place called Castle Garden, that was created not to protect America from the immigrants, but to protect the immigrants from the Americans who were trying to fleece them when they got to America. Um, and so that's, for the first 40 years, that's how immigrants were greeted. They were put into Castle Garden with this huge theater in the round, and they were kept there to protect them from the shysters until they could be educated about uh, what might happen and met by somebody who could protect them. So your descriptions of the Lower East Side were possibly the most vivid in the book. Can you tell us a little bit about that the place, the sights, the sounds, the smells that you described were very real to me? Sure, so I talk about in the book the Lower East Side in kind of its famous era as the home of Eastern European Jews who come to America in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And so that was a place that was characterized by five and six story brick tenements. So you go down there today and it looks pretty much the same as it, uh, as it did then. Um, these are walk-ups, so there's no, no elevators. Um, whereas today, when you go to rent a building in New York, you pay more to be on a high floor so you get a good view. In those days, you paid less to be on a high floor because you had to walk up all those steps. And not only walk up the steps, say, with your groceries, but you also had to walk up the steps um, with water because there was no, when those buildings first opened and those Jews first arrived, there was no running water in those buildings. You got the water in the yard from a pump and you had to carry buckets of it up the stairs and that was mostly women doing that work. Uh, and you carried water up for drinking, for cooking, and for washing, uh, including washing clothes, uh, which you would do in big basins in your house. Um, and then the streets of the Lower East Side were very crowded in part because there are lots of street vendors. Uh, because uh, as I talk about in, in the book, peddling is a, you know, throughout the ages, a very common immigrant trade. Just walking down here from the Upper West Side today, uh, we passed, had at least 100 peddlers, right? Peddling baseball caps, peddling water, peddling other kinds of food, and so, and that's, you know, 
that was co that's common now for, for an immigrant to, to do when they first arrive in America. That was common 100 years ago, 200 years ago. It's just always been a thing that immigrants have done because um, you know it takes very you don't have to know very much English and um, it takes no training. Some peddlers actually make lots of money peddling. That's one of the other, in my new book, uh, which is about the Irish, the Great Famine, uh, the Irish who came from the Great Famine, was one of the uh, things I found using the records of the Emigrant Savings Bank, is that peddlers actually were better off than almost all other Irish immigrants in New York. So peddlers actually made a lot of money. Um, not all of them did. Um, and certainly looking at the peddlers I passed on my way here, it was hard to imagine them making a lot of money. Um, but overall and over time, peddlers, uh, in the past at least, have, has, peddling has been a very lucrative trade. Oh, she talked about the cork vendor? The cork peddler? Right, so I talked I talk in, in the book about this one guy who, uh, in my new book, who peddled nothing but cork, bottle corks. Because if you were poor, and you know, like, Today I have my leftovers and I go get my Tupperware and I put this stuff in the Tupperware, but if you're poor and you can't afford Tupperware, you're going to scavenge things like bottles and keep stuff in it. But when you find the, the discarded bottle, it usually didn't have a top. And so I talk in, in my new book about this one uh, immigrant who did not peddle nothing but bottle ports. And he ends up saving the equivalent, in about 10 years, he saves the modern equivalent of about $30,000 just from Pettit. And you know, saves enough that he's able to move from Manhattan to Brooklyn, which in those days, well, even today, I guess, for a lot of people, is like the fancier place to live now than, than Manhattan. And that's what it was for the Irish. The Irish, if the Irish made it to Brooklyn, they knew they had made it, and that was like a sign of success if you could move to Brooklyn. So that this sort of leads into a recurring theme in your book, which is about the hard work of some of the immigrants. And I really appreciated some of the stories that um, people that I had never heard of, uh, people who did amazing things for their family, but also you, you talked about people like Oscar de la Renta and Henry Kissinger. Um, I love the story of the Steinway family. Could you pick a few of those and tell us one or two? Sure. Um, right, one of the things you find when you look at American and New York immigration history is how hardworking the immigrants are. And the immigrant bank records, which I use for Post City of Dreams and my most recent book, and a little bit in Five Points, one of the things you find with, that, with those records is that, um, or, or that kind of leads out from the page at you is, that it's not just the random person from some other place in the world who comes to America. It's, it's ambitious people. It's not a cross-section of people from China or from Italy or from any place they come. It's the most ambitious young people, the people who are willing to work the hardest to be successful, people who really are ambitious to be successful and make a name for themselves. And you see this with immigrants over and over again. So just with the ones you mentioned, um, I talk in City of Dreams about this family called the Steinwegs who come from Germany and they're moderately successful in Germany. They're piano makers, but they're, they're, there aren't many people in 19th century Germany who can afford their pianos and so they hear that you know, America is a land of riches where there's a huge middle class that could afford pianos and so they uproot themselves from Germany and move to New York believing that they can be more successful here. And so at first what they do when they arrive is they don't just go into the piano business even though they have all the skills they need to do that and they have the money to do that. What they do at first is the father of the family uh, tells all his sons, he's got, he's got four sons, he has them go to other piano makers in New York City and says go get jobs in their places and find out everything you can about their businesses. How they do the work, how much they sell for, what their overhead costs are, what their marketing strategy is. And so he sends them as spies and they work for several years for these other piano makers. Um, one of the sons, uh, in, in lifting something in the shop, uh, badly injures his back and he's never able to work again. 
Um, but they do that for years, uh, for several years, and then once the family has gathered up enough information, they open their own piano business and they Americanize their name from Steinway to Steinway. Most renowned pianos in New York. And so they start their business in the mid-1850s, and by 1870, they're able, they've done so well that they built themselves a huge factory on Park Avenue, what's now Park Avenue kind of in the 60s. Um, and then after another 15 years, they're so successful that they open a huge factory in Queens. Uh, that's an entire village. Uh, and the workers all, they build housing, and the workers all live there because Queens is like, you know, boonies. There's no way to get from where the immigrants live to in Manhattan or Brooklyn to, to Queens where that, where that works and no, no subway goes up there yet. So, so he builds housing for them and houses his immigrants there and has this huge factory in Steinways, of course, become the most famous uh, in the world. Oscar de la Renta is another one I talk about. He's uh, born in the, the Dominican Republic. Dominicans are one of the biggest groups in New York today and have been for the last 40 years or so. He comes again, as is so often the case, he does not come from an impoverished family in the Dominican Republic, but from a relatively well-off family. They send him to uh, study in Europe, where he studies fashion design and works as uh, works for some leading uh, fashion houses. But then when he wants to start out on his own, he feels like uh, he's not going to be able to break in in Europe, where, where kind of there are these famous houses and it's hard to start your own brand. So he comes to New York. Um, where there are lots of Dominicans and there's lots of people who pay money for fashion and starts his Oscar de la Renta brand and eventually he becomes famous for, you know, uh, dressing first ladies and, and movie stars and the like. Yeah, it's huge. The trajectory of that is just amazing. And it all comes from that hard work. Yeah. From extraordinarily hard work and extraordinary ambition. Ambition. Both yeah. those things yeah. together. So there was another story that I really, really loved in the book. And when I first started to read it, I was upset by it because I didn't know how it was going to end. Um, and it's a different type of transformation, and it's not one that has to do with uh, ambition, but it's one that has to do with what this exhibit is about, which is about the boundaries between people, people's uh, divisions and, and hatred of one category or another. And if you could talk about you know, the name, I don't know. No, I don't know which story you're talking about. Felix Brandon. Oh, Felix Brandon, sure. Um, so, if you read a, a, a textbook on the American Civil War, um, typically there's going to be a part where they talk about what soldiers thought about, and what northern soldiers thought about emancipation. Right, you think about it, when the American Civil War starts, the focus of the war is to get the southern states to rejoin the Union. And Abraham Lincoln says, you know, in order to try to help get those states back, he says, you know, I will not touch slavery. I have no power to touch slavery. Slavery is, is protected by the Constitution. Um, he says, I don't like slavery, but I have no power to change it or and certainly not to end it. Only a change of the Constitution, he says, could do that. Um, then as the war goes on, eventually Lincoln realizes that he's not going to be able to bring the country back together so long as slavery continues because Southerners believe that they need their own nation to protect slavery because Northerners just diametrically oppose it. And so he announces in September of 1862 that he's going to issue that if the South in four months doesn't come back into the Union, then he's going to issue an emancipation proclamation using his powers as the commander-in-chief of the armies to, uh, to take slaves, as confiscate slaves, because the Constitution says the president can punish uh, punish people who rebel against the government, and one of the standard punishments for rebellion was confiscation of property. And Lincoln says, since you say these people who you enslave are property, I can confiscate your property, and that's the property I will confiscate if you don't come back into the Union. So Lincoln announces this, in part hoping this will end the war, but he really knows the South isn't going to come back voluntarily. 
But a lot of northerners who hear this um, are not happy about it. They think this is going to prolong the war, and they're very racist, and they don't want blacks to be of equals. And they say, well, if blacks aren't slaves, then the next thing you know, they'll have the same rights that we do. That wasn't obviously the case at the time, but that was what people imagined would be the result, and it eventually did become the result. But And so a lot of northerners didn't like that idea. And in particular, um, Irish Americans who were at the bottom of the socioeconomic ladder in the Civil War period saw the emancipation of the slaves as a threat to them. Uh, in part an economic threat, but even more so kind of a status threat that there was up to that point a really huge gap between the status of the Irish and the status of African Americans. If you end slavery, the Irish thought that gap is going to diminish and the Irish saw that as diminishing their own rights is how they would put it. And so in Civil War textbooks, the way this is typically um, typically brought to life is this letter that's written by this one um, Irish American Union soldier named Felix Brannigan, who writes a letter to his sister back in Pennsylvania uh, saying in very racist terms, we in the army don't want the slaves emancipated, uh, you know, and he uses the N-word several times and just says, they're not our equals, they can never be our equals, and we won't fight to make them our equals. And so this is in pretty much every Civil War textbook you see used to illustrate northern opposition to emancipation. Uh, it's not that everyone in the north was against it, probably more people were in favor of it, but there was a large minority that was against it, especially Irish Americans. So everybody who writes about the Civil War knows that story, but what I discovered doing more research about Brannigan, because I saw this letter and I thought, I can't use it unless I'm able to say what happens to Brannigan after he, the war finishes. And so I start doing research on Ancestry.com, which is where I do a lot of my research. And I discovered that he's living in uh, the South after the war. And that in fact, he's become a US attorney. And so I look more into his story, I discovered that after the war he became a clerk and then he used his clerkship as a stepping stone to uh, study the law. In those days you didn't have to go to law school to become a lawyer, you could just become a clerk for an existing lawyer and that lawyer uh, after hours would teach you the law and then as long as you passed the bar exam you became a lawyer. And so that was how Brannigan became a lawyer and then through political connections he gained through the army he um, becomes a U.S. attorney uh, in the South, in Georgia or Alabama, I can't remember which name. And, and so what does he end up doing in, as a U.S. attorney in the South? He prosecutes Klansmen who are attacking African Americans. He couldn't have become a U.S. attorney in the late 1860s had he not become a Republican, the party of Lincoln. And so uh, one of the reasons I found the story so interesting and in some ways even uplifting is here's someone who was clearly in 1862 very racist and yet by the late 1860s he's become a Republican, the party of Lincoln, the party of emancipation and soon after that he is prosecuting Klansmen um, and so that just shows the way that you know people can change and I think that's a great, a great thing to see. <laughs> no, I think we've covered, you know, all the, the themes of the book, so why don't we take questions or comments? Yes, Lisa. Um, I work in, I do, I'm in medical ethics and I work in vaccine hesitancy and um, a historian I know who is a historian of vaccines policy in the U.S. <coughs> I asked him if what we were seeing politically during COVID and the misinformation and the disinformation, had he seen anything like this? I mean, he studied this over the centuries. And he said he hadn't seen anything quite this bad of politicization <coughs> of vaccine information and public health information. And so I I know you're right that that what you write about is the same and over and over and over again you see it. But do, is, is the current animus 
and politicization of immigrants. Is that in line with everything you've done, you know, studied over the years, or is there anything particular about now, or does every, is this me just thinking my own era is particular? It's a little bit of both. I mean, so on the one hand, so definitely the United States is politically very polarized today in a way that you don't see very often, but you certainly saw during the years leading up to the Civil War, right? So, so that's a scary thought, but that's this, but that's the last time I I can think of, right? That that was super polarization getting to the point where half the country said we don't want to live with the other half of the country. So, so in some ways, I, I think there's nothing in, nothing much in American history that we haven't seen before in one way or another. I think also animus towards immigrants has been very strong in the past. And, right, so you get you think in the 1920s, Congress passed laws that you know, banned immigrants from three quarters of the globe and only allowed a small number of immigrants from you know, another 20% of the globe, leading just, you know, basically, you know, basically the place Trump likes immigrants from, like Northern Europe, the Nordic people, that's what the United States voted for in the 1920s. And that was the immigration system from the 1920s to the 1960s. And so, I mean, even when Trump was president and you had a Republican Congress, they didn't try to do that. So in some ways that tells me <coughs> things have been quote unquote worse. Um, or at least that what we're seeing now is not completely different. I can't decide if that's comforting or not. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Other questions or comments? Uh, I just want to know the, what makes America so, uh, so you know, number one, you know, you know so in the world, for the whole thing. Um, because of what make 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 exactly the American um, position of the uh, very not the high in the world? What is that? So I think the reason that the United States attracts so many immigrants and has for so long is that there's a perception, much of which is true, that um, first that the United States has a much more um, dynamic economy than other places, that that the ability to to use a, a term that's used too often, go from rags to riches, that that opportunity in America is greater than in other places where there are more kind of structural or uh, or other kind of impediments to to improving your your status, and so there's a belief that in the United States uh, you can become rich quickly and and no matter where you come from, and there's a belief that other places that's not possible, and so I think that's the thing that over the centuries keeps drawing people to the United States: the belief that that entrepreneurship is rewarded more in the United States than it is in other places, and that getting to that position of being able to be an entrepreneur is easier in the United States than it is in other places. That there are fewer obstacles to doing that. Well, I was supposed to be, and you alluded to earlier some of the tensions within the other Jewish community between the Eastern European Jews and the Western European Jews and the Austrians. Yet, the, the self-help groups that you bought out, I think the cell that's projects, and some of the other um, systems are put into place to help newcomers assimilate as we're going to um, to what extent have other ethnic groups embraced that? I think of today's Chinese immigrants in Chinatown that have Tom relationships and really these relationships to help assimilation, helping out in those sort of younger, if not charitable, at least in a community based organization. Is this still something available to 
the exhibit rules that you see, um, sort of historical, the historical presses have they carried on to the modern day to the extent that they had in the 19th century? Um, I think for the most part, yes. I think immigrant groups definitely still create organizations to help the most recent immigrants, and that's something that's been the case in the United States for centuries. Um, yeah, I mean, in some ways you don't see there's a little difference in that the government now does some of the things that private groups did in the past in terms of helping people who become impoverished or become unable to work, um, uh, things like that. Um, there's not as much need for like charity medicine as there was back then, right, with you know nurses who would go and travel around immigrant neighborhoods trying to find people who were sick and give them assistance. You don't see that so much today. Um, but you know the Henry Street settlement still exists, and they still do work in immigrant communities in New York. So it's definitely still part of the part of the story. Yeah, I was wondering because if you look at the history of them being effective, and I was wondering if other communities have modeled any other kind of self-help organizations based on historical models. I can't think one mind just in terms of the question. Yeah, I'm not sure. Too. So you mentioned the immigrant runners who met the, the, the boats. Was there any kind of system like we see today of, uh, what do they call it, where you, you, you pay them at your home country to, to get you through and to get you over the border? No. What do they call them? You know, coyotes. Coyotes or, yeah. It, was it that kind of like, getting from the homeland to America or was it the, the exploitation just uh, once they reached here? So, so the people who would smuggle you over the border yeah. doesn't have to start until there's immigration restriction to, to keep you out of the country. And so that starts with Chinese immigrants in the 1880s when Chinese immigration is restricted. And then in the 1920s where there's a huge restriction, then you have immigrant smugglers primarily smuggling in Jewish immigrants from Europe and Italians because those were the two groups that most wanted to get into the United States and, and couldn't. So yeah, you have smuggling so, rings the same way that you did today. Golden Venture, right, was the, the ship that runs aground in, in far Rockaway full of Chinese immigrants. Famous recent example, but you had similar stuff. I, I talk in City Dreams about uh, Italians getting smuggled into to uh, Far Rockaway in the 1920s. So it's another example of the more things change, the more they remain the same. Anything else? We should have people have some cookies. <laughs>